Uh, so I'm James Zimmerman. Uh, I'm a partner with the TAF Law Firm, and um, delighted to be here today. I, we've been fortunate to be uh, uh, partners with the Angels for many years now, and, and so really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you guys. Uh, Brian and I are going to kind of tag team this. I'll pass this to him, and he can introduce himself. But uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, corporate structure. Uh, this is this is going to be more legal and tax, but we'll try to keep it uh, somewhat at the business level. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about uh, some different uh, tax structures and corporate structures for entities that uh, angel investors and VCs typically invest in, and then talk about uh, the term sheet, uh, which I know was discussed a little bit this morning, but we'll talk a little bit about uh, term sheets and some key deal terms. And uh, we'd love to keep this interactive. We're going to try to keep this pretty informal. Brian and I work together a lot. We could talk about this for hours and probably bore you to tears, but uh, um, we'd love to uh, keep this interactive. So we'll leave some time for questions at the end, but certainly any questions along the way or if we kind of fly over something you want to dive into deeper, uh, please raise your hand and we'll, we'll jump into it. Perfect. I want that? No. Perfect, yeah. Uh, Brian Burning, I'm the uh, office managing partner of BDO uh, USA LLP, effective of one one of this year. Prior to that, I was with SS and G, who combined uh, with BDO um, on that date. So, um, uh, what do I do? Um, well, um, I'm an entrepreneur who happens to be an accountant. Uh, best way to describe it. Um, do a lot of M and A. Um, I've done quite a bit of angel investing, um, and in just about every project you can think imaginable, from a restaurant to a brewery. To a, very, a large number of tech companies, both uh, direct and also um, uh, through the different venture funds. I've also um, uh, done convertible notes. I've done preferred stock. Uh, I've done just a little bit of it, everything individually at this point. And where I haven't done it myself, I've certainly uh, worked with many of you in this room, and, and uh, uh, certainly also with James, and, and helping us get through some of the complexities that come along with. Um, uh, being an angel investor. Um, so that's a little bit about me. Do you want to start, Brian? Sure. So, we'll, so, so the first part of this is, um, and we'll go to the slide that kind of talks about what, what we'll talk about. So <clears throat> as you can see, we've got a few topics for discussion. Uh, the first couple really relate to the, the legal entity that is used for, for the company that, that angels invest in. So corporation versus LLC. What are the pros and cons of different legal entities? Some of the associated tax issues. Conversion considerations, one of the common things that, that uh, folks deal with, uh, typically in a venture capital investment, sometimes in an in a, uh, angel investment, is converting the legal structure of the entity that may have been formed by the entrepreneurs into a new structure. Often it, it takes the form of an LLC converting to a corporation. So we'll, 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 there's some <clears throat> detailed tax stuff that we won't dive too much into there, but wanted to give you a few kind of take-home messages on that. Uh, and then we'll get into a type of investment, uh, convertible debt versus preferred stock or equity, some of the tax issues associated with that, particularly convertible debt. Again, there's some kind of watch-outs and, and uh, sort of worst of the wise that Brian and I have, have developed over the years on convertible debt we wanted to raise. And then really hope to have time to talk about some term sheets. There should be a couple of sample term sheets in your packets uh, as well, and we're not gonna go through those line by line, but did wanna hit a few key points on those and talk about some key deal terms uh, as well. And then if we have some time, we'll talk about some loss allocation issues as well as it relates to particularly partnership uh, tax entities. So with that, Brian, I'll turn it over to you and you can yeah. kick off the- You, you know, yeah. can everybody hear me okay? Because usually I don't need a mic, so we'll go this way. So we'll that, 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 that works. That way you can chime in here. And let me, let me ask you a question. Do you ever recall in a circumstance where you were representing a minority shareholder where you were able to dictate the type of entity that they wanted to be? They wanted it to be? So I would say in a, in a convertible note angel investment, I, I'd say the answer is almost always no. I mean, the, the typical, and I'm, I'd, I'd be interested in feedback from, from others in, in the room, uh, particularly the, you know, Tony and John and others that do this a lot, but my experience has been, you know, typically, uh, so, so the, the typical kind of seed deal would be you'd have a company that you'd identify, a early stage business, um, the angels or, or whatever group of seed investors are going to invest a few hundred thousand dollars, maybe a million, maybe a little more into the deal, often on a convertible debt basis, and we'll, we'll get into the, the details of that. Um, most of the time, the, the legal entity is what it is. It's, it, it was set up as a corporation, or it was set up as an LLC, and, and we, we kind of decide to live with that. Uh, we decide it doesn't make a huge impact either way to us. 
the, the place where I think it does make an impact is in the later round when you're doing a preferred stock round and, and often that is with a what I'll call an institutional venture capital investor like like a Dan Fleming who was here before those investors pretty much always want to invest in a corporation uh, and there's some there's some reasons for that some of them make more sense than others but the, the reality is that, that's how almost all institutional venture capital investors invest. But I think on the seed round, my experience has been most of the time we we end up being pretty agnostic and kind of rolling with what was there. Yeah, and, that, and that's been my experience is, in, in being a minority investor is usually I, I'm, I'm stuck with whatever we have unless there's a compelling reason to change it. But the question always comes up, you know, what's better, a corporation or an LLC? And I said, well, if I could rub a magic, you know, magic ball, uh, I would tell you 10 years from now. Because the reality is it kind of depends on what happens in the future, not necessarily what happens today. And I'll, I'll talk about, what I hope to do is talk to you about, you know, the, uh, the things that are good and the things that are maybe a little bit misleading. Oh, that sounds fantastic. Uh, you know. Um, so um, what I hope to do is kind of talk to you about certain things that, that make LLCs or corporations attractive or what you think are attractive and really aren't quite as attractive as you first thought. And so that brings us to a corporation. So we're talking a little bit about a corporation, investing in a corporation. Now I'm talking your classic C corporation, which you, uh, which are pretty common, as you mentioned. And certainly, if it's uh, uh, a later round company that you're uh, investing in, it wouldn't be obviously the angel side of things. Uh, but a corporation, there are three things to really take away from a corporation that could potentially be um, helpful. The one a lot of people hear about is this concept of 1202. It's a code section, 1202, the very first thing you see there. There was a time that it was 100% exclusion on the game for a short window of time. That has since expired. And the beauty about that, there was also an AMT preference. Anyone know alternative minimum tax? Anyone ever heard of that concept? I bet everyone in this room is an AMT, all right? All right, all right, certainly most of you. So there was a time it was actually not even AMT preference, so you could have had a game and excluded 100% of the sale. Today, it's a 50% exclusion. On the surface, that sounds great. But because it's an AMT preference item, the net benefit's really around 1% to 2%, okay? So it doesn't, so 1202 is, when somebody comes to me and says, well, I got this 50% exclusion again, that's why we want to be a corporation, feel very confident about the investment. Everyone goes into every investment, feels confident about it, so that sounds great. But if you're an AMT, and most of you are, an AMT preference item can really minimize the value of that benefit. That isn't a compelling reason for me to advise somebody to become a corporation. Um, under the current rules, under the current law. But 1244 is the second. Um, 1244, uh, $50 or $100,000 ordinary loss. I'll tell you where it comes in handy in a startup. Explain it first. When you invest in a corporation, if you invest $10,000 into a startup and it's a corporation, unlike an LLC, the losses will not flow through to you. Um, those losses will accumulate as a net operating loss and carry forward up to 20 years, okay? But if that investment is written off, if the investment doesn't work out, what do I have? Generally, I think we'll have a capital loss. But under this provision, it's qualified small business stock, and if you're doing angel investment, 99.9% .9 of the time you, it qualifies. Um, you, can, you can write off an ordinary loss of either 50 or 100,000 single married filing joint. Okay, single 50, 100,000 married filing joint. So you have the ability to take a $100,000 ordinary loss versus a capital loss. Why does that matter? Well, if you're married filing joint, you're, you're limited to $3,000 up to your gains, your capital gains. If you have none that year, down here, you have a $3,000 loss, carries forward the rest. So it can take you a long time to monetize that investment you made, that poor investment you made, obviously. Um, so 1244 gives you the ability to take an ordinary loss. But I'll tell you where I think it comes in handy. When you're a startup, you generally have one of three expenses. You can have multiple classes. You have, from a tax perspective, you have startup expenses, organization cost, and research and development expense. What do I mean by a startup? You are a startup until you are an active trader business, which means generally that you are open for business. So you're soliciting customers. If you're an angel investor, many of these companies are in the process, as you mentioned, of, of, of building, if you want to, the product or the service that they're um, uh, expected to deliver. 
So these startups aren't necessarily active trade or business until um, generally, until they're an, an actively soliciting customers. So the problem with startup and or cost is you capitalize those expenses. Whether you're an LLC or a corporation, it's an asset on the, on the tax books. In an LLC, they're the proverbial black hole. You never get those as ordinary losses. You have to remember. In a corporation, you still have the 1244 provision. So if this organization isn't, most of the R&D process is complete, but it's incurring a lot of startup and or cost. Uh, most recent one that I invested was a brewery here, it's um, Braxton Brewery here in Covington. Very little in terms of R&D, but a lot in terms of startup and or cost, training costs, things of that nature. Um, corporation may be more advantageous than an LLC if there was a real high a belief, a high risk of failure, right? I'm, I didn't invest in it, I think it's going to be a high risk of failure. So, but that would be an example of an organization that's going to have higher startup and org costs. Those things get capitalized. I may never see those flow through losses. The only expense in a startup company that is deductible is research and development. Now, what is research and development? That can be labor costs, that can be materials, it can be supplies, anything that's used to develop the product that uh, you're investing in, the company is built. Make sense? Getting to add there? No, I, I just, well, I, I, I would say um, back to your 1202 comment, I think that is one that gets a lot of, you, you'll hear that a lot, and I think my experience is the sort of the closer you get to it, the less good it looks a lot yeah. of times. Yeah, um, it's, it's oversold. The, it was wonderful yeah, one time, yeah. and it's, today it's oversold. Uh, the 1244 can, can be really helpful in, in the yeah. circumstances you described, right, which is only a, a certain kind of company, but in a certain right. kind of company it can be helpful. You're right. And, and the third, and the one that I think really matters, is this 1045 rollover option. If you invest in a company and there's a successful event, there is a way that you can uh, effectively defer the recognition on the gain to a later period if you roll over in part or in total proceeds from the transaction into another qualified small business, qualified small business stock, okay? That can even be through a pass-through such as an investment partnership. So if I have a company that was through a successful transaction, let's say I have a $100,000 gain to report, and, it's, and let's just presume for, for per, my basis was zero, and I decide that I want to roll over 60,000 of that into another company. I have 60 days to do that. Well, sometimes that's not a long, that's not a, long, that's not a um, what do you want to call it, a long period of time to do, to identify a company and do your diligence, right? It's a pretty quick period. So it's good to have some companies on the sidelines. If you're getting close to that exit event, you'll, you'll probably know if that's happening. Uh, it's good to have some of those on the sidelines. If it did, you're that serial entrepreneur and serial angel investor where you're looking for new deals. What you can do is invest that into an investment partnership, things of that nature, um, because the only thing that's, ex ex that's, that's not qualified is if you create a corporation. So investment partnership, venture funds, those things, those are investments you can make and still qualify so long as those venture funds are investing in qualified small business stuff. 